from CBS 4 News. This is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFeedy. Good morning, I'm Jim DeFeedy and welcome to Facing South Florida. Joe Gruders is a state senator representing Sarasota. He is also the state chair of the Republican Party of Florida. We had a chance to catch up this week on a number of issues, including the likelihood of a bill restricting abortion, the governor's race, and COVID policies. But we started with some basic politics. You know, I, I think back to when President Obama won the state of Florida, Democrats in the state had a 700,000 voter registration advantage. Today, that's, that's essentially gone. I mean, Republicans and Democrats are about equal in the terms of numbers of people that they have registered on their, on their sides in the state of Florida. What happened? What happened to the Democratic advantage? Well, in the state with 21 and a half million people, it's crazy that the state is basically almost evenly split now. But the Republicans have work, been working around the clock really for the last you know, 20 years to try to cut down that advantage. You're exactly right. We cut it from 750,000. And even at the 2018 midterm cycle, the Democrats over had over, I think, a 275,000 voter advantage. And today it's less than 20,000. I think Florida is going to flip red within the next couple of weeks. And basically what's happening is, is I think it starts at the top. And I think people look at the leadership here in Florida, which, which has been Republican over the last 20 years, both with the governor's office, with various Republican governors in the Florida legislature. And I think that creates success. And I think people look at the success we've had and they attribute it to the Republican Party and the conservative leadership. And there's no better example than Ron DeSantis right now. I'm, I'm going to give you guys credit. I'm going to give you credit for being out there working, doing, doing the groundwork that needs to be done. But how much of this is also, from your standpoint, just an amazement that the Democrats haven't done the basics when it comes yeah, to right. registering voters? Well, Jim, there's no question that this is the primary function of the party. We don't set policy. Our job is to register voters and to turn out those voters. That's our job. That's the Democrats' job. We crushed the Democrats on the ground over the last couple of cycles. If you just look at the 2020 cycle, people were surprised that Donald Trump won, won with, I think, 3.4% of the vote in a state where we've had consistent cycles where it's been less than 150,000 at the top of the ticket. We crushed the Democrats on the ground. We crushed them in voter registration. We crushed them in turnout and we crushed them on election day. But at the end of the day, it comes down to trying to assimilate with like-minded people who share core beliefs. And that's where the governor comes into play. It's the governor and the leadership that sets policies that creates the environment for people to want to move here and want to be able to register as Republicans because they want that freedom and liberty that everybody else so enjoys. Okay, Joe, so if, if the policies are so good, if if you're winning on the issues, if people want to come here because they like the direction of the state, then why have Republicans in the Florida legislature made it harder to vote? Why, why pass the bill that you did last year, which offers new restrictions on early voting, on vote by mail, by ballots? Why make it harder for people to vote? If you're so good on the issues, why make it more difficult? Florida was a gold standard in the 2020 cycle. I think whether it's Republicans and Democrats across the board, 67 counties, we finally got it right. But it wasn't without a lot of, you know, you go back to the 2000 election controversies between Bush versus Gore, how close that race was, and how we had to tweak the system. And almost every single cycle, we tweaked the system to make it better. It's all about making sure that elections are safe and secure and that people have confidence in the overall system. So what we're doing is, is listen, we're, Florida, it's unbelievable. You could vote early for over uh, two weeks. You could vote by absentee with no uh, excuses. You just have to request it. Or you could vote uh, uh, in person. So anybody that says we're restricting voters' access, uh, they're misguided because I, I added it up. And you almost have, like, it's over a 1,000 hours that you could actually vote. Yeah, but you did, but you did restrict things like, for instance, now you have to apply for a mail-in ballot every year, whereas it would be like a regular, you know, regular cycle. If you were signed up for one presidential election, next presidential election, you would get your, your ballot. That's no longer the case in Florida. Same thing with, with third-party voter registration efforts. You're limiting that. The, you, you allow drop-off boxes, but you're going to make it more expensive for counties to have 24-hour drop-off boxes because you're going to require physical presence of election officials at every box at every minute that they're there. Doesn't that make the system harder? 
No, it doesn't, because I think people want a safe and secure election. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican. But you said we had a safe and secure election in 2020. But we are continuing to tweak the process based on things that we've seen in other locations and to make sure that we continue to have safe elections. Because what you want is you want that security. And if you go back to the, the drop boxes, for example. Yes, it should be monitored. The, the voter registration, I think you, you talked about. We want to make sure that we have groups that are registered and we don't have these third party uh, outside groups that nobody knows what's going on. And in terms of delivering ballots on every cycle, I don't think it's necessarily uh, a hardship to say, okay, I want all the ballots the next two years. So let me make a call and make that happen. What we don't want to have happen is have people have ballots being sent to locations where people no longer live. Right now, that you're also a state senator, and right now this, the makeup of the Senate is there are 24 Republican senators, 16 Democratic senators. Um, you know, in this next uh, cycle that we see coming up in 2022, how much do you think that's going to change? Um, one of my goals this cycle, and I've had a, the, the, you know, kind of a new vision on this, is my goal is to field a candidate every race uh, across the state in all state legislative races and as many so we can put the pressure on everybody and that uh, we focus on winning as many seats as we can. Uh, because listen, I think 2022 is going to be a great year for Republicans because I think the national environment for Democrats are, is at such a low because the failure of the Joe Biden and his policies to resonate with everyday Americans and their, their, their ideas are so far out of touch of reality. And in contrast, having Ron DeSantis as our leader leading the charge on freedom and liberty. I think it's a great contrast to run on. I think we're gonna have lots of success in the 2022 cycle. And I'm looking forward to being the chairman of a party that's gonna have another uh, wave of uh, Republican victories. Well, will part of that success come with the type of hijinks we saw in the last uh, election cycle where you had ghost candidates being put in? I'm speaking specifically about something that your former colleague, state Sen former state senator, Frank Artillis is accused of, of placing shadow candidates in three Senate races, one that may have been decisive in the case of uh, current state Senator Ileana Garcia, where she won by like 32 votes and a shadow candidate that he's accused of having bankrolled, you know, siphoned off more than 6,000 votes. Uh, is that the type of uh, way that the Republicans want to win in the state of Florida? Listen, for me, it's we don't need any tricks. Uh, all we need is uh, great policies, and we have those. I'm not a big fan of these tricks. And listen, anytime anybody breaks any type of law, I'm not saying that Frank did, uh, that Senator Attilas did or did not, uh, but I think justice should be served. And it, it, listen, people should be held accountable. My, my well, what was, your, I mean, I was going to ask you that. When you first heard about this, and let me be absolutely clear, there is no allegation that you played any role in this. So, but I just want to ask, when this came to light, what was your reaction to hearing this? Well, like, like many, you're obviously shocked when you hear any type of allegation and you want to say, is it true? Is it not true? And I'm, I'm really interested and I'm following this case uh, very closely, but it's uh, for me, listen, we have the policies on our side. I think people like freedom. I think people want it government out of their lives. Do Democrat, wait, wait a second. Do Democrats not like freedom? Uh, I don't think that they do. I think that they, you know, they, they're, it seems like they're after more government restrictions, more government mandates, more government oversight. And on our side, we want to let people get government out of your way to you live your life. I think that's the, one of the, the, the common core principles of the Republican Party. Is it, to, is it to live your life or to die as you see fit? And I don't mind if a person wants to, you know, take fails to take responsibility for themselves and causes actions that lead to their deaths. We've seen lots of that in Florida when it comes to COVID, but shouldn't there be some responsibility as well for the government to help protect people so that, so that just because you may have a certain f feeling for freedom, your freedom shouldn't impinge on my ability to live safely and securely as well. Isn't that the role of government is to bridge those two things so that you can have a certain amount of freedom, but your freedom doesn't end up killing me? Uh, no question. If you're talking about the COVID pandemic and vaccine mandates and everything else, listen, I think that everybody should be vaccinated. I think you, sh uh, I, I'm in favor of vaccinations and your individual right to get those. But at the same time, I'm for people's individual choice if they choose not to get them. You know, if they don't have the vaccine 
and somebody has it, then it's, those guys are the ones at risk. Uh, not the people that are vaccinated because the vaccine should be able to protect them. Let's talk a little bit about the upcoming session. Uh, you know, because it's, 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 it's one of the reasons why I always enjoy talking to you is because you wear so many hats so I can cover lots of ground with you. What do you see this upcoming legislative, legislative session being about? We already talked a little bit about how important redistricting, both on the congressional, state house, state senate or seats, how that important that can be. Let's put that aside for a second. What are going to be some of the big issues that, that you're looking forward to tackling in this upcoming session? Well, listen, you 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 nailed it. Redistricting is probably the responsibility of the, of the legislature this cycle. Number two, probably still dealing with issues relating to COVID. Uh, making sure, you know, we pass some the liability protections for healthcare uh, uh, groups and, and hospitals. Uh, those probably need to be relooked at. I think it was only for a year. I think we got to make sure we make sure that Florida is as competitive as possible to allow people to get the jobs. So all these people are moving here. They need to be employed to make sure we allow as many uh, employees uh, to work. I didn't hear abortion on that list. And you and I both know that because of what, the, what took place in Texas, there's all this pressure on, on uh, Florida Republicans to, to follow suit with some version of a heartbeat bill or a Texas version style bill, you know, is, is this a fight you're looking forward to having to wage? Well, Jim, what's interesting is a lot of people don't know this, but I was the PAC chairman for Florida Right to Life for, I think, three and a half years uh, before I was ever elected. To me, that's why I'm in politics. I think life is precious uh, from conception to natural death. I think it's worth fighting for. And one of the reasons I filed pro-life bills uh, the, in a variety of different degrees over the course of the last five years but one of the things we've always been uh, uh, challenged with is the ability, even if we could pass in the legislature, is getting it through the courts. Texas opened up the game, and it's going to create a new situation to where we uh, uh, have these options available to us. And so as a result, I think what's going to happen is you will see some pro-life bills uh, be filed. And I think, listen, we have a cons this is what you get when you elect conservatives, right? And you, when you elect people who care about life, such as me, uh, you'll see some life bills pass this cycle. I think uh, it, it, maybe not as we won't go as far as what Texas did. Because Why not? Wait, 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 wait. Why not? Why not go as far as Texas did? If, if this is if this is uh, this is your position, why not go all the way and say, say, you know what, let's create a, a system where where any individual can almost sort of ride in as a vigilante and, and make some sort of uh, financial stake in shutting down abortion providers? Why not eliminate any loophole for rape and incest? If, if, that's, if that's the bill that's working right now and the Supreme Court is allowing it to be enacted, why not enact it here in Florida? Well, I will tell you, as a former PAC chairman of Florida Right to Life, uh, the, you know, the life of the mother, rape, incest is, is an ex acceptable exception. Uh, number one. Number two, I will tell you that uh, the, in talking to Kathleen Pasadomo, our Senate president designate, she didn't like the fact that you could basically turn on your neighbor, you know, turn on your neighbor and have individual lawsuits going out. So I think uh, a Texas life bill to protect as many lives as possible is is going to be what's presented. Uh, I just don't know when I say that we won't go as far as Texas is I don't know if we're going to have basically the private cause of action to have people turn on you know your neighbors if somebody has an abortion on the democratic side you have charlie chris and nikki freed and i believe next week you will likely see your colleague uh, state senator annette tadeo jump into the uh the democratic primary for for governor uh What's your hand? I mean, you're you're a smart guy when it comes to politics, and and even understanding democratic politics. How do you handicap that race between Charlie Chris, Nikki Fried, and Annette Tadeo? Wow, it's going to be an interesting race. Uh, I know all three personally. Uh, it's a uh, the problem for all of them. It doesn't matter who wins the primary because I think Governor DeSantis is so strong, and during this pandemic. Yeah, no, no, I get it, Joe. I get it, Joe. Governor DeSantis is very strong. You're you're all in on DeSantis. I'm asking you, stick with the Democratic side of things. How do you, who do you think wins that race on the Democratic primary? I think Annette Tadeo probably has the best chance that, that overall to win the general if she even came close. But she, the, her issue is going to be resources and and money getting out of that primary. Uh, 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 Nikki Freed obviously is. 
the flag bearer for the Democrat Party here in Florida, and she has been. So I think her name ID is probably pretty good. And without today, oh, I think she is probably the front runner. But in Charlie Chris, who's been around forever, uh, I've seen polling on him. I think he may be competitive right now, but I think he's probably the weakest as a result of his inability to stay with one party and people's a lack of trust in him overall. Uh, but it, like I said, it doesn't matter who they put forward. We are going to absolutely crush whoever they put up as the nominee. And there's no question in mind, I'd bet my house to, and give you 10 to 1 odds that Ron DeSantis will re win re-election here in Florida and he's going to win big. How big? Uh, give me a number. I, I, give me a number. How? Wait, President Trump won the state by three and a half points. What's Ron DeSantis, in your opinion, going to win by? I think we win by five points, at least. All right. The over-under is now a set at five points. Place your bets. When we come back, U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, stay with us.